celebrating the birth, death, and life of Jesus Christ. And what I'm going to do is I just want to answer some questions because there's a reason why we do what we do in the celebration of Christ and why do we choose this particular Sunday and what was happening and what's the history behind it. It's important because I think sometimes we come out to church on Easter morning and we just do it because it's a ritual, it's what people do. But I want us to always understand why we do what we do as the body of Christ. Amen. So my question for you this morning is, what is Easter Sunday exactly? What is Easter Sunday? There's a lot of confusion regarding what Easter Sunday is all about. For some, Easter Sunday is about Easter bunnies and it's about uh, decorating and coloring Easter eggs. Um, it's about Easter egg hunt. It's about dressing up in beautiful dresses and, and hats. Uh, most people understand that Easter Sunday has something to do with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Some churches this morning got up and had a sun, what we call a sunrise service. And they brought the service in, you know, 6.30, 7 o'clock this morning. Uh, so I think most of us in the United States and abroad understand that Easter Sunday has something to do with Jesus. It has something to do with the resurrection of Jesus. But sometimes we are still confused as to how the resurrection is related to the Easter egg and the Easter bunny. So, how is the resurrection of Jesus Christ related to the Easter egg and the Easter bunny? How did we put those things together? Does the Bible speak of anything concerning Easter eggs and the Easter bunny on Easter Sunday, on the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Have, have you read that anywhere in the Word? Amen, somebody. So, biblically speaking, there is absolutely no connection between the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the common modern traditions related to Easter Sunday. Amen, somebody. So, what are the origins of Easter? So, the origins of Easter are obscure. It is often assumed that the name Easter comes from a pagan figure called Easter, who was celebrated as the goddess of the spring. Uh, in the Saxons of Northern Europe. According to the theory, Istra was the goddess of the east. And that's where the sun rose. And her symbol was the hare or the large rabbit. Come on, somebody. And that is a symbol of fertility. And a festival called Istra was held during the spring equinox by the Saxons to honor her. So that's how we come up with the Easter bunny and the name Easter from this particular theory of this goddess of the East. And again, her symbol was the large rabbit or the hare. So the theory on the origin of Easter is highly problematic. Uh, and the reason why is because there is absolutely no hard evidence that such a goddess was ever worshipped by anyone, anywhere. So we don't know where this tale came from. There's no true evidence of that she ever existed anywhere. But this is what was this is what was told down through the years. So essentially what occurred is that in order to make Christianity more attractive to non Christians in the ancient Roman Catholic Church, churches began to mix the celebration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ with this pagan goddess. So the spring fertility rituals are a source of eggs and bonnies because of that tradition. Now that's the background of why Easter Sunday and the resurrection has its copious. But it is not biblical. So for the last few years, I would say for maybe for the last, what, 20 or 30 years, Christians have been trying to separate themselves from that pagan celebration and we're no longer calling it Easter Sunday but we're now calling it what? Resurrection Sunday. Amen. So by all means you know we are to celebrate Christ's resurrection on Easter Sunday but we understand that Christ's resurrection is something that should be celebrated not just on Easter Sunday but every day all year. 
come on, somebody. So at the same time, we choose to celebrate Easter Sunday, we should not allow the fun and the games to distract our attention from what the day should truly be all about. Am I saying that you can't look at the Easter Bunny? Am I saying that you cannot color the eggs and hunt the eggs and do whatever fun activities you want to do? Make up your own activities, whatever. I'm not saying you can't do those things, but what I am saying is that you must understand that those things are not biblical. But as long as you're celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ, I don't think the Bible, Jesus would be concerned about what else you do at that time as long as there's nothing that's going to distract from him or is unholy. Amen, somebody. So the fact that Jesus was resurrected from the dead and that his resurrection demonstrates that we can indeed be promised an eternal home in heaven by receiving him as our Lord and Savior. Now that's the bottom line. That's the fundamental purpose of Resurrection Sunday or Easter Sunday is to understand that Jesus Christ, he did die. He was crucified. He did hang on the cross. And now he has resurrected and was celebrating that resurrection. And I'm going to back up a little bit and I'm going to ask you, okay, so what is Good Friday? And what is Holy Friday? And why do we celebrate that? So Good Friday is also known as Holy Friday. And it is a Friday immediately preceding Easter Sunday. So it's the Friday that we just had. And it's celebrated traditionally as a day on which Jesus Christ was what? Crucified. Friday is the day that he was hung on that cross, the day that he was crucified, the day that he died. Assuming that Jesus was crucified on and died on Friday, should Christians remember Jesus' death by celebrating Good Friday? I think we should. I, I actually think this entire week is a holy week and is to be celebrated. But we always celebrate Jesus Christ. All day, every day, but there is the time that can be set aside where we intensify that celebration and we intensify that praise and that worship. So the Bible does not explicitly say on which day of the week Jesus was crucified, does it? I haven't seen it, deep. But the two most widely held views are that he was died and crucified on Friday or Wednesday. So, some argue that, well, it was Thursday. So, I'm not going to dwell into that today because, you know what, to me, I don't care what day he was crucified on. It doesn't matter to me whether it was Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. I'm just so glad that he died for me, that he made the decision to allow himself to die. He laid down his life. The Bible says, Jesus said, no one took my life from me. I laid it down. It was a decision that he made to do that for us, even while we were in our sin, even while we were absolutely not concerned about him or anything close to him. Not even born 2,000 years before we even came on the scene, Jesus Christ made the decision to hang on that cross and lay down his life for us. So the Bible does not instruct Christians to remember Christ's death by honoring a certain day. The Bible does give us freedom in these matters. So someone get Romans chapter 14 for me, and let's look at verse 5. Romans chapter 14, verse 5. The Bible, I'm going to repeat that, the Bible gives us freedom and how we celebrate and how we honor certain days. And it reads, one man considers one day more sacred than another. Another man considers every day alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. That gives us freedom. Because one man is considered one day more sacred, being more holy than another. Another man considers every day to be alike. One day is no more important than the other to him. But the Bible says each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. So whatever you believe, just be fully convinced in that. So rather than remembering Christ's death on a certain day once a year, the Bible instructs us to remember Christ's death by observing the Lord's Supper. That's, he says, remember me by doing this. Turn there. I'm going to get 1 Corinthians 
chapter 11, verse 24, and we're going to, and I want you to read um, verse 24 through 26 for us loudly enough to pick up on the mic. First Corinthians eleven twenty four through twenty six through twenty six and it reads on this slide. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, "Take, eat. This is my body, broken for you. This do in remembrance of me." After the same manner also he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, "This cup is the new testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it." remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he comes. Amen. Amen. So the Bible says, rather than remembering Christ's death on a certain day, once a year, we ought to remember him how? By observing the Holy Communion. By breaking bread and drinking the semblance of his body being broken and his blood being shed. That is how we remember him. So why is Good Friday referred to as good? Well, what the Jewish authorities and Romans did to Jesus was definitely not good. It wasn't good. See? Get Matthew chapter 26. Well, now I actually get Romans chapter 5 verse 8 for me. It wasn't good. However, the results of Christ's death are very good. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. What does it Romans, say? Romans 5, 8, and it reads on this line. But God commanded his love towards us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's how God demonstrates what? To us, his own love. So 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 tells us, For Christ died for the sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit. Hallelujah, somebody. This is good. This is good stuff this morning. So many Christian churches celebrate Good Friday with a subdued service usually in the evening, in which Christ's death is remembered, and they have solemn hymns and prayers and thanksgiving and a, a message about his suffering for our sake, and then they observe the Lord's Supper. So, but whether or not Christians choose to celebrate Good Friday or not, the events that day should, should be ever, as you said this morning, on our minds, because the death of Christ on the cross, along with his bodily resurrection, is the paramount of the Christian faith. That is the fundamental foundation, the whole thing about Christian faith. Okay, let me say that word again. About Christian faith. Because it takes faith to what? Believe that all this occurred. All we have is the word. We don't have people, we don't, we don't have anyone living that can tell us what really actually we have to believe this by faith. And that is the, if you are a Christian, that is the one thing you know. That is the one thing you believe. You believe that he was born of a holy, of, of a virgin girl. Well, that takes great faith to believe that someone can be impregnated and, and still be a virgin. Never taught by men. Impossible. But we know that God, there's no impossibility with him. You have to believe that first. Then you have to believe that he lived and he walked this earth as the as God, as a, as the Godhead, in unity with God the Father and the and the Holy Spirit. You have to believe that he did the things that he said, that the Bible says he did. Yes, you have to believe he walked on water. Yes, you have to believe that he fed 5,000 plus with two fish and what? Five loaves of bread. You have to believe that he turned water into wine. And you have to believe all these things by faith because we don't have 
evidence, and we don't have anyone that can tell us that those things really happen. What we have is the word of God. So those are things that as a Christian you have to believe. Then you have to believe that he was beaten all night long. That he was spat upon. That he was bruised and wounded. You have to believe that they hung him on a cross. And they nailed him to it. That they put a crown of thorns on his head. You have to believe this by faith. You have to believe that they took a spear and speared and, and jabbed him in his side with it. You have to believe that in all of that, not one bone was broken. Why? Because the Bible says not one of his bones will be broken in any of that. You have to believe that they put vinegar, gave him vinegar when he asked for water because he was thirsty. You have to believe that they did the most horrific things to our Lord and Savior that could ever happen. Crucifixion was one of the worst possible ways to kill a person. You must believe that he said, if I wanted to, I could have called legions of angels to remove me from this cross. But I chose to hang there, and I chose to hang there for you. That's Christian faith. Then you got to believe that he went into the grave and he was there for three days because he said, as Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days, I will be in the belly of the earth for three days. You have to believe that when he said that, that was true and it took place. You also must believe that while he was there, he defeated Satan and made a mockery of him. And he set the captives free. Those who had already passed away before he came, he set them free. And then ultimately, you must believe that he rose. He got up out of that grave. Took his garments and folded them up neatly and left them there. So that whoever comes in and sees his garments folded nice and neatly would know that it was on purpose. He purposely got up and folded his garments and left them there in a neat way to say, I'm coming back. That's why we celebrate Easter Sunday. I don't have a problem calling it. I don't have a problem calling it Resurrection Sunday because I know why I celebrate it. Whatever you want to call it. It's about my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So the Bible does not mention the observance of Easter and so does not directly address the question of whether Christians should celebrate Easter. But Christians who believe we should celebrate Easter and those who believe we should not are hard pressed to make a solid biblical case for today. You can't you can't argue that you shouldn't, and you can't argue that you sh that you should. Jesus' death and resurrection are realities we celebrate all year long. All year long. This one day, really, it means nothing to me at the end of the day, because every day is Easter. Every day is Resurrection Sunday. But I'm going to talk about why we, even though it may not mean anything to us as Christians, we, we want to talk about why we want it to mean something to us, though. So, in fact, the church meeting on Sunday is an indirect celebration of the resurrection of Christ who arose on the first day of the week. So, go with me to Luke chapter 24, verse 1. Someone get that. The church meeting on Sunday is an, uh, it is, is an indirect celebration of the resurrection of Christ who rose on the first day of the week. This is why we have church on Sundays in the first place, because we believe that he what? Rose on the first day of the week. What does it say? Luke chapter 24, 24 uh, verse 1. Now upon the first day of the week, very early, 
early in the morning. They came unto Jephthah, bringing the spices which they had prepared, and certain others with them. Amen. So the first day of the week, this is what they did. Now we go now to uh, Colossians chapter 2, verse 6. Colossians chapter 2, and let's look at verse 6. It tells us that as you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. So passages like Colossians, I'm sorry, chapter 6, uh, verse 16. Colossians chapter 2, verse 16. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holiday or of the new moon or of the Sabbath day. So Jesus tells us there. Let no man therefore judge you in what you eat or what you drink or what holiday you should ob you should observe. Or in some type of new moon. No no uh what do you call the signs? The the signs where you talk about cancer or Virgo or whatever, Sagittarius. He says, you know, no, 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 you don't, you don't, you don't let no man uh, make you look at those things. Uh, or the Sabbath day. Uh-oh, I just burst somebody's biblical uh, just wide open right there. All right, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Let's look at verse 20, um, uh, chapter 10, verse 23. I'm going to read down a couple verses, a few verses. And it says, all things are lawful for me. This is Paul. He says, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. Whatever is sold in the, in the shambles that eat, asking no question for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. If any of them that believe not bid you to feast, and you be disposed to go, whatsoever is set before you eat, asking no questions for conscience sake. But if any man say unto you, This is offered in sacrifice unto idols, eat not for his sake that showed it, and for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof. Conscience, I say, not thine own, but of the other. For why is my liberty judge of another man's conscience? For if I by grace be a partaker, why am I evil spoken of for that which I give thanks? Rather, therefore, ye eat or drink, and whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor the Gentiles, nor the church of God. Even as I please all men in all things, not seeking thine own profit, but the profit of many that may be saved. So what Paul is saying here is he's instructing us concerning whether we should celebrate Easter and how to go about doing so. These passages give us the freedom to do whatever we conceive is right in our own heart and, and, and to make certain that whatever we do, that we do it unto the glory of God and that we not offend other people in the process of doing it. So these passages indicate that Christians have great freedom in questionable matters. As we as observing certain holy days or eating uh, 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 various things. So in that in that same passage, he said, "I have the right to do anything, anything you say, but not everything is beneficial for me to do. Even though I have the right to do it, Raymond, it's not beneficial to me. I have the right to do anything." But not everything is constructive, Paul says. No one should seek their own good, but the good of others. Paul was writing here specifically about eating food that was sacrificed to idols. He went, to, he went on to say that believers could eat whatever was sold, sold in the market or given to them by the unbeliever without raising questions of conscience, even though it was sacrificed to idols. Messing somebody up right now, please. The principle is that the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. And when He created it, what did He say? It is what? Good. So 
if you look at First Corinthians chapter 10 again, right there, and you go back to verse 26 uh, from the New Living Translation, it says, For the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. If someone who isn't a believer asks you, Do you home for dinner? Accept the invitation if you want to. Eat whatever is offered to you without raising questions of conscience. But suppose someone tells you, this meat was offered to an idol. Don't eat it out of consideration for the conscience of the one who told you. It might not be a matter of conscience for you, but if it is for the other person, well, why should my food be limited by what someone else says? If I can thank God for the food and enjoy it, why should I be condemned for eating it? This is what Paul says. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Don't give offense to the Jews or the Gentiles or the church of God. I too try to please everyone in everything I do. I don't just do what is best for me. I do what is best for others so that many may be saved. And you should imitate me just as I imitate Christ. It's not about you. It's what basically what he's saying. But you can do it if you do it. As long as you're doing it all for the glory of God. Why? Because everything belongs to God. Everything. So Christians should celebrate Easter to the extent that they can do so to the glory of God with their giving. It's okay. And I know a lot of Christians are moving away from celebrating Easter because they got this thing about the Easter bunny and the egg. Well, so what? Those who are convinced that Easter is a celebration of a pagan goddess or that it somehow honors the idols of a godly society, okay, if you believe that, then abstain from Easter observance. But don't, don't push your beliefs on me. Yes, I'm a Christian, but so you're telling me, well, I'm not going to celebrate it because it's a pagan holiday and you shouldn't either. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says if I want to, I can, and as long as I know why, I'm celebrating. I'm doing it for who? The glory of God. So those who are convinced that Easter is a celebration to the pagan goddess, and don't, don't celebrate it. Those who feel free to celebrate Easter, but whose observance of it might cause a problem for another believer, well, do it, but don't flaunt it, is what he's saying. Don't, don't flaunt your freedom. Do, do what you got to do, but but understand how, where others are. You know, keep, keep, be mindful of their beliefs as well. If, if, if certain Easter traditions uh, will cause a Christian to compromise their biblical truth, then those traditions should be neglected. You should not do that. However, when participation in Easter traditions and Easter celebrations give us cause to praise God, we should feel free to do that and to enjoy them and invite others to do the same. In other words, you got to find that place in wherever you are. If you're among people who take offense to that type of thing and you know, okay, well, you don't want to stand there, but at the same time, you, you do get to um, enjoy your freedom. But God says, just be mindful and pay attention and, and understand where other people are because not everyone is in that place. And I feel the same way about everything. I feel the same way about movies. Okay, well, movies have some curse words in it. Movies have some killing and some stabbing in it. Movies have sex scenes in them. So, so are Christians never to go to a movie that has sex scenes and stabbings and shootings and Whatever. If that offends you, don't go. If you can't handle it, don't go. But if I feel like as a Christian, I have the ability and the freedom to go, it won't affect me. And I feel like that's what I want to do, then I feel like I have the right to do that. My problem is in where do I glorify God in that? I, I would have a hard time trying to figure out, well, where am I glorifying you in this? If you can figure out how to glorify God in anything that you're doing and it being real and, and consistent with the word with the Bible, you're not going to do so. Can someone say amen? Mm -hmm. So no matter how you personally observe or don't observe Easter, it does seem to be a particularly good time to share the gospel with others. Society at large acknowledges Easter in one way or the other. Even those who focus primarily on secular traditions like the Easter Bunny or the colored eggs or the chocolate tend to recognize the holiday.
holiday is related to Christianity. Most people, even though the stores flood, you know, with the Easter baskets and the grass and the chocolates and all that, most of these people understand that that these are Christians who are celebrating this holiday. Christians can use that awareness as an opening to explain who Jesus is, his importance, his death, the good news of his resurrection. So use that time to reach out to others. You're in the store and everybody's at the counter and you got your candy and they have their candy out. And you're like, oh wow, did you hear me celebrate the resurrection? Everybody come. Let me that open. Use that. Just be like, huh? Cool. And that's your opportunity to, to just give God the glory. Right? So use that awareness as an opening to explain who you Easter comes in the springtime, and much of the excitement around Easter has to do with the excitement of spring and with the promise that everything is a new, everything is, is, is a new growth. And how amazing to be able to share with others uh, that what is observed at Easter time. Share, share your belief. Everybody's saying, oh, what are we going to do for the holiday? Oh, we're going to church and celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Send out your text message. Happy, happy Resurrection Sunday or a Happy Easter. He has risen. Use this day to put forth Christ. Send out a group message to your family and your friends. What are you doing for Resurrection Sunday? I'm going to church. You want to join me? At Easter, Christians can enjoy celebrating that reality in a focused way with one another. And we can and should share that amazing news with Everyone, everyone who will listen. This is the good news right here. Today is the good news, D. He has, he has risen. Our Lord and Savior has risen. And I don't have a whole lot more that I want to say about, about this. I think that we all understand that we have the right, we have the right to celebrate Easter Sunday. We have the right to not celebrate Easter Sunday. But we, what we do not have the right to do is to not celebrate Jesus Christ. We must celebrate him every day, all day, all year, every season, no matter what. Good in our life, bad in our life, up, down, well, sick, happy, sad, broke, wealthy, we must celebrate the life and death of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, no matter what. Come on, somebody. Amen. Amen.